All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. This is the first community call I'm actually organizing in full, which is very exciting for me. And hopefully it's going to be really good for you. So we've got two really, really good speakers lined up, um, not to put pressure on the speakers. And then we've got time for Q and A, and we're going to go through a whiteboard activity as well. So there's going to be a very, very quick introduction from me. I've not got any slides prepped for this. Um, because I want to give as much time as we could to the speakers and the interactive portions of this. So like I said, we're going to do the welcome, have our two speakers, a bit of time for Q&A, whiteboard activity, and then I'll give you an update on any ASAP Bio activities that we've been up to lately. We are a nice and welcoming community, so there is an interactive element to this, so please be respectful of everyone who takes part using professional and inclusive language, uh, particularly given the talks we're going to be talking about today. And we will be sharing the recording from this on YouTube. And when we do finish the whiteboard activity, I will share that amongst everyone who has registered as well. So don't write anything offensive or that you wouldn't want to be shared with people on there. Um, I will check it before I send it out to everyone. So, that is your very quick introduction for me because I want to hand straight over to Hannah Hope. Hannah is the Open Research Lead at the Wellcome Trust. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Wellcome Trust, they are one of the biggest funders, certainly in the UK. And they're great at being at the forefront of the positive changes that funders are really leading uh, in terms of research culture and the funding landscape. They were at the forefront of preprint adoption in the UK, and they've got some really cool EDI based initiatives going on at the moment. Um, no idea if Hannah's going to talk about those or not, but if you're not familiar with them, go to their website after this as well and check them out. I'm going to stop my screen sharing so Hannah can share. Thank you, Johnny. I have not included uh, the EDI work that we're doing in this presentation, but I am happy to take any questions on it. Uh, in the Q&A stage. Um, so, as Johnny said, I am the Open Research Lead at Wellcome. Um, we are a global charitable foundation uh, seeking to improve health for everyone um, by funding research, policy, advocacy, and through building global partnerships. And it's our ambition to spend 16 billion pounds on research um, between 2022 and 2032. Um, in terms of what we fund um, and how we work, we have four core funding areas, as you can see on this slide here, infectious diseases, climate and health, mental health, and discovery research. Those four areas interplay and there's a lot of co-funding, but um, how we do that work how we fund and how we expect researchers to work is underpinned by three cross-cutting areas um, research environment translation and portfolio integration and data for science and health my own work in open research sits within the research environment team and for us research environment is really about how we manifest our values as an organization in terms of how um, we work, but also how we uh, want the research that we fund to be done. And that really centers on research being open, engaged, ethical, and uh, done by diverse people involving uh, diverse populations. I'm going to talk a little bit today also about some of the work that happens in our portfolio integration team, because that's really where we look at monitoring our portfolio. And I think when you're talking about research assessment, there is an element of that that, that feeds into um, uh, portfolio monitoring, at, at least in terms of how we at Welcome uh, do this work. So in the rest of my presentation, I'm really going to kind of pivot into talking on preprints and research assessment. Um, but I did want to just give a little bit of a kind of, I don't know, conflict of interest or just uh, declare, put my cards on the table when it comes to uh, the work that we've done at Welcome or that we, we kind of have within our portfolio. So we have our own um, publication platform called Welcome Open Research, and that is a preprint first 
uh, model and we are I also sit on the board of um, eLife, um, which now is a preprint review uh, publication venue as well. So I've got a bit of uh, an interest in uh, preprints and their role within research. So preprints in research, and I wanted to kind of talk talk about really the values of preprint because I think this is important as to why we are involving them in research or why we think it's so important to involve them in research assessment you know there is an opportunity to iterate on research you know share early findings get that early feedback potentially more diverse feedback than you might get through a traditional peer review process um, in journals we believe that they support an increase in the diversity of what research findings can be publicly shared. And I think from a funder perspective, you know, really one of our aims with funding the research is we, we want people to know about the outcomes, be that positive or negative. And so any kind of publication bias, that's not good for us achieving our ultimate ambition of improving health. And so preprint supporters in that aim Enabling research findings to be made available in a more timely manner. You know, some of the things that we're working on at Welcome are hugely pressing problems. We do a lot of work within infectious diseases, uh, pandemics, epidemics, but equally when it comes to climate change, the impacts of it, and also mental health. So we don't want research to be stuck in a one to two year peer review process. It's, again, it's not good for supporting us to achieve our aims. And as an organization that's had a long interest in access to research, you know, it's an opportunity for a fully open publication type. So when um, we look at the use of preprints in, in life science, um, you know, we've seen a lot of growth in their usage um, since 2018. This is data taken from Europe PubMed Central. And if you don't know this platform, they index a lot of preprint servers. Uh, in the abstracts, they also index full text for um, preprints that are published by their funders grantees. And they integrate this preprint within the main research body. So it's a great resource if you've not yet looked at it in terms of using preprints in your research. Um, but, you know, while there is growth, um, it's still actually only a subset of um, publications. So, um, from Welcome's perspective, we know that when we've seen the peak, only a roughly about a fifth of our publications are coming from a preprint. So it's not yet every publication is starting a preprint from our perspective. Um, we've got some more work to try and do and encourage their usage by our researchers. Um, again, this is data on the second graph from Europe PubMed Central, and it, it is showing you the preprints that have been linked to a journal article that's also within the database. Um, so, you know, it's not necessarily everything that's out there, it's just what's been identified and linked within the literature, but still, it's a subset of our overall um, output types. So, when it comes to research assessment, um, some of the values of preprints to research apply again, you know, it allows us to carry out a more timely assessment of a researcher's output you know the work that they've done in the last year or two um it means we don't have to be uh accept a kind of imprint or submitted manuscript we can actually get access to um, the more recent research outputs and we hope that it also supports in removing some of the publication bias in the assessment of research um, we have done a lot of work with our committees to uh, stop people using journal name as a proxy. Um, obviously, we can't rule it out. 
um, particularly when it comes to peer reviews. Um, but we we have done a lot of work on that. We continue to do that. But you know, a preprint has that advantage of it doesn't have that badge attached to it. Um, ASAP Bio has done some great work uh, when it comes to advocacy and getting funders and institutions uh, to use preprints as part of uh, research assessment. And their website has a great list um, on funders that include or have policies around the use of preprints um, in terms of research applications, but also uh, end of grant reporting. And, you know, I would really kind of a plea here is to, you know, do look at what your funders policies are. Um, but equally, if they if you can't find a policy on preprints or if you're not sure whether preprints are an eligible output, ask them because there's a strong chance it could just be that they haven't considered it or maybe they thought that their current definition of how you can cite research included preprints, but to you it's not clear and, and you know, maybe it just needs spelling out. Um, funders do want to know what researchers think, what they need. <laughs> Um, so, you know, do ask, um, and I think that's a really important thing. Um, and the same at an, in, an institution, you know, advocate for their use and discuss how preprints are important to you and why they should be included within that. Um, so what have we actually done or changed at Welcome when it comes to how we assess research? and um, enabling preprints to be part of that. Uh, so when it comes to funding applications, we have uh, shifted to a uh, semi-narrative CV format. So this is where um, researchers write in prose their contributions um, to uh, their research. Well, we call it knowledge, uh, generation of knowledge. That's our section that relates to research outputs. Um, we also have sections around um, contributions to the wider community and also um, how researchers contribute to creating a positive research culture within the teams that they work. Those are the three kind of areas that we're really focusing in on with the narrative CV approach. Uh, so I said we ask uh, applicants to talk about how they have generated knowledge. We define knowledge and research outputs in the broadest sense. Um, and so it's not just research uh, journal publications, preprints, but it's also data sets or policy reviews. And so we, we've really tried to be quite expansive on um, what a research output is and, and encourage people to really use that flexibility to talk about their work. Um, we have a, a limit on um, how many outputs researchers can reference, and we strongly encourage that researchers provide a narrative for why they've included each uh, research output within their application. You know, what is the relevance? What was their contribution? What was the impact on others? Um, because, you know, we want to make these research outputs more than just a DOI or a citation. You know, I think that's very important to reflect um, or to use when reflecting on research, you know, it's what enables to move away from a list. And it's those narratives that I think can support us in shifting away from proxies that people have used because they feel like they have that, you know, they can't read 50 articles. So therefore they're just looking at a, um, a title. Whereas actually, if you have a narrative that enables you to really target in and focus in on, well, they said such and such, well, maybe I'll just go check that or I'll look at this part here. So it, it, it really supports reviewers in actually looking for the specifics within your application and using the outputs um, to really assess the work that you've done. Um, we don't allow impress. Um, you can't say impress at such and such unless you can provide a preprint DIY. You know, you have to be able to link to a public version of um, a written research output. And so you know, ultimately what we're trying to do is ensure that when it comes to research assessment, diverse research outputs are kind of threaded through the application. 
hence the thread in the image. I was supposed to start with that, but forgot. Um, so when it comes to end of grant um, or like high level portfolio monitoring, um, end of grant reporting, we do ask about research outputs that came from the grant. This includes preprints. Again, we're trying to be more expansive than just about journal articles. Um, we do that at the end of grant and two year post grant. But actually most of our analysis doesn't happen on a single grant level. We're really looking across the whole portfolio of grants that we have um, to analyze all the outputs, um, publications, data sets, preprints. You know, we're working to include preprints where we can identify them as welcome funded. So second little plea, please cite your funder and your grant number even in your preprints, not just your journal articles, it helps us pull that information, those outputs into our um, portfolio analyses um, without having to ask you to do it and to fill in the form with us. You know, ultimately, I mean, I personally harbor the ambition that end of grant reporting for publications, that's not a manual thing because in the main, we're just looking to use it at a high level and we can programmatically pull that information in. So um, the more information we can pull in automatically, the less hopefully in the future we'll need to ask you to provide. Um, so just a few thoughts on the, the future, I guess, in terms of preprints and research assessments to finish off. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to reflect, you know, is there a way of capturing preprint peer review within a citation succinctly? Um, I think that would be a really interesting thing to try and achieve, um, help us bridge that gap and, and really surface the community or journal agnostic peer review that's happening. And there's, there's lots of platforms that are working to, to um, surface that information, but bring it into a, a succinct way that it can be viewed by um, funders and peer reviewers would be really interesting. Now, I kept... Um, the, at least the data on the um, life sciences focus of preprints. You know, at Welcome, we take quite an expansive definition of health. Um, we have researchers working in many other disciplines. Uh, you know, how are preprints used within those disciplines? Um, is there a role for um, publishing long form research outputs in a kind of preprint like format? Um, that's, that's something that we are, we're thinking about at Welcome. Questions around bibliodiversity and, and multilingual research ecosystems. I think this is interesting from a perspective of how research is published, but also how it's assessed and how, you know, can people apply for application for funding in multiple languages? Or um, can you, can you translate that uh, within the process? Um, and I said, when it comes to research assessment that of welcome, we have shifted to the narrative CV approach. You know, this is quite a change. Um, it's a change that quite a number of funders are making. And there's a lot of interest um, in how we evaluate that and look at the um, impacts that has and, and are there any uh, unintended consequences of those changes. Um, and with that I will finish um, and I think passing over to needy rather than having questions now so I'll stop sharing thank you Hannah if people do have questions pop them in the chat otherwise we'll have set a quick Q&A session after needy great so let me start sharing my screen so Needy is going to give a great talk on a topic she's already discussed a few years ago now so maybe it'll be updated a bit and last year won the ASCB prize for excellence in inclusivity, I believe. So I think we've got a perfect speaker for this particular topic. Nidhi. Thank you. Um, and um, what's up, y'all? My name is Nidhi Bala. I'm a professor at uh, the University of California, Santa Cruz. And I'm going to discuss um, what I think is the importance of preprints in um, removing in in emphasizing equity in research assessment. And I'm gonna hit on some of the same points that the last speaker um, addressed, because I think that there are really, really important patterns 
that are um, that we can use over and over again to sort of go, move away from um, some of the bias and status that we typically assign that we incorrectly assign um, to research assessment and publications. So um, part of the reason that so um, I am a member of the ASC, ASAP um, Bio Board. Um, and one of the reasons that I am a member and I am committed to the use of preprints is because I think it's an important strategy to improve equity in research assessment. Um, in 2019, um, I was particularly focused on this in the context of faculty hiring. Um, and so I wrote a perspective in my society, in the ASCB Society Journal, MBOC, on strategies to improve equity in faculty hiring. And um, if you're interested in this, it's now publicly available, it's um, open access. And, um, whoops, a daisy, what am I doing here? There we go. Um, and so um, the, the, suggest, the strategies in this um, perspective are evidence-based strategies. So strategies that have been shown to work in other contexts and in academia to improve equity in faculty hiring. And the strategies were to develop a thoughtful and explicit commitment to equity, to develop a rubric to assess diversity statements and use them early in research evaluate, evaluation so that there could be a more holistic assessment of a person's career, use mechanisms to avoid relying on flawed assessment proxies, and this is what I'm going to emphasize in the rest of the talk, cluster hires to achieve critical mass and limit isolation, which is often um, a major barrier to retention and engagement um, with faculty from historically excluded groups, and um, to identify promising late stage postdoc candidates and invite them for seminars or to apply for positions. And a lot of the um, um, major funding agencies have identified this transition from postdoc to faculty as a major point of funding um, focus. And so um, if you are interested in improving equity during your faculty hiring process or increasing the diversity of your faculty um, with increasing members of historically excluded groups, I encourage you to look at some of those um, organizations and funding agencies and the applicants that have both won those awards and were shortlisted for those awards because those number those awards are often limited in number um, and but and there are an incredible number of qualified candidates and not all qualified candidates win the award but are pro, but are definitely competitive enough for the award and competitive enough for faculty positions. Okay. And the reason that I wrote this perspective is because there is an incredible pattern of homogeneity as we ascend the academic research hierarchy. And so here I'm showing you a paper from 2016, a graph demonstrating the relative diversity as we ascend the academic um, hierarchy. You can see that as we go from associates, for people with associates degree in the training period to people who are tenured faculty and full professors, there is a dramatic increase in the representation of well-represented men, right? So this is white men. And so what we want to emphasize is, is that we have people who are interested and invested in scientific careers, in research careers likely, but that they are often either actively dissuaded from moving on in the academic hierarchy, or there are structural limitations or marginalization that contribute to the um, ascension of well-represented men and the um, and the limitation of non well represented or minoritized or historically excluded populations from ascending our academic hierarchy, and this demonstrates that our academic hierarchy is not a true meritocracy. If this was true, then we would see that there would not be this incredible bias in who who gets to ascend. And this point is made even more clear in a paper from Kenny Gibbs, where he and several other people did an analysis of what happens to the academic faculty pool given that the training pool has been diversified so extensively in the last decade. And so here he is demonstrating in these two graphs the incredible disparity that exists between how many um, trainees we train in our academic environments and how many of them actually go on to get faculty positions. And so this is true from for people from historically excluded groups. So these are racial or ethnic minorities in this first graph. And then this is also true for women, right? For a lot of, in a lot of our graduate classes, women are the majority, if not 50%, sorry, the, I wanna reverse that. 
are 50% of our training populations, if not the majority of our training populations. And yet we don't see that in our faculty pool. And I think a major contributor to this is, oh, so before I move on, I just wanna um, reinforce some terms that I've been using. So um, there are different ways to talk about um, people who have been historically excluded from participating in academic STEM. And so there's members of underrepresented groups, ERM, which is the term that the NIH typically uses. Um, I'm going to use historically excluded to demonstrate the point that structures in and institutions have, you know, um, produced policies that have historically excluded these populations, but other people also use marginalized and minoritized to emphasize the point that this is not, they are not, my, they are not minorities in our population because they are like fewer in number. Structurally, they have been placed at a disadvantage in our system. Okay. And so I think when we think about these structural marginalizations, when we think about these policies, what we want to do is reconsider assessment practices. We want to redefine our sense of excellence and merit because currently our definitions of excellence and merit favor well-represented men. And what I mean by this, and this is a lot of text, so I apologize, um, but what I mean by this is, is that we rely on flawed proxies and these flawed proxies maintain structural marginalization. We rely on where people have published, emphasis on impact factor, emphasis on high impact journals. We rely on where people have trained, institutions, high like uh, elite institutions versus less elite inst institutions. We rely on who people have trained with, whether or not the, 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 person, the PI that they did their graduate work, their undergraduate work, or their postdoc with um, is well-known or well-respected or well-recognized in the community. And this, again, is a structural, um, can also be structurally um, affected. And so just, and I should just point out that I have benefited <laughs> from all of this bias myself. And so I am in a unique position where I recognize that I myself have benefited from these flawed proxies and it is because of that benefit, it is my responsibility to shine a light on the way that these limit who get to participate in science. And, you know, quite frankly, limit the success of science and limit the innovation in science. Because we then we, you know, in my mind, we limit ourselves to mediocrity. And so an evidence of this is the diversity innovation paradox, a paper that came out in 2020, that demonstrated that scholars from historically excluded groups actually innovate at higher rates. This was in STEM. And the way that they showed innovation was that the, these scholars introduced links between previously unlinked concepts. So they brought together disparate uh, fields and linked them together in new and novel ways. And the, But these novel contributions were discounted, not adopted by others in the field, and they were often correlating with a lack of retention in academia, right? So there is a demonstration that there are people who are directly innovating in our community and because of the structural marginalization are not reaping the benefits or contributing to innovation in, in STEM. And so some of the things that we can do to move away from the inappropriate use of these flawed proxies one suggestion is Sandra Schmidt's great suggestions to have applicants identify and contextualize their graduate and postdoc work in a cover letter for a faculty position, right? So again, here, I'm relying on um, faculty hiring, but this can be used in any context. And just like the last speaker talked about, this is a way that we talk about the narrative CV. Have the applicant in a system where we typically cannot read all the papers. I know everyone's like, read all the papers. Nobody's going to read all the papers. But we can ask the applicant to contextualize their research in a way that allows us to assess the impact in a way. And if we, you know, if we have concerns, if we have issues, we then we can go and read the paper. But then we, but if we are concerned about an ability to appropriately assess applicants or scientists, and we don't want to read all the papers, and we don't want to use these flawed proxies, what we want to think about are mechanisms that allow us to, to move away from these flawed proxies and still assess impact and innovation. And I would argue that these narrative CVs and these narratives of impact are ways to do that. They may have unintended consequences, 
You know, some people are trained to be more judicious in their language because they have been punished for being more um, um, uh, expansive with their language. And so we should be aware of that. But I do think that as a way, a situation where we encourage people to, to contextualize their research allows, can be a way, a way more impactful and less flawed way to assess research. And then quite frankly, I think that preprints are an incredibly powerful mechanism to move away from these flawed proxies. Pre anybody can post a preprint as long as it's not a review on BioArchive. That's a good thing, that's a bad thing but it addresses the challenge of delay in the review process, even at journals where they are not recognized as high impact, right? If I submit to my society journal, I'm typically still in a situation where the publication of that paper will probably take four to six months. It's uncoupled from some of these flawed proxies, right? We're still gonna get some association where, where people have published, where people have, sorry, not where people have published, where people have trained and who people have trained with, but we've removed some of the flawed proxy of where people have published. And because of this, when we decide that we're going to use preprints in our research assessment, we still need to articulate our commitment to equity. We still need to recognize that even though we've removed some flawed proxies, we're still relying, we may still be relying on others. And so we need to be careful and judicious when we assess preprints to make sure that we're not falling back on some of the flawed proxy and actually assessing the research, which is right in front of us. Um, and so I'm gonna stop there and um, I will take questions at the end. Thank you. Um, so we have a good 10-ish minutes for questions. And I, I'm going to get it kicked off because I've got questions. So question for both of you. Where do you think the balance of change lies with this? Do you think that getting everyone to use preprints lies with the funders and their initiatives or with university management? Or is this a, an individual thing? I mean, I would say the more the merrier, <laughs> um, really. Um, if it's just funders, then it, some people might say it's top down. Um, but equally, you know, it, it takes an army to assess research. And so, and it takes an army to do research and communicate research. So really the, the more of us who are raising the awareness, pushing these agendas, the better, I think. I would totally agree, because I think the reality is, is that um, um, STEM is, and science in general, is a feedback loop, right? Funders are instituting policies that bring along the naysayers and the slow adopters and the fast adopters are the ones who are encouraging funders, who are encouraging journals that are encouraging, right? So I think you need multiple strategies. I think yeah. you need multiple players. I think you need people who have variable levels of risk who are involved in this project to articulate that risk, but also explain why they're participating in the process. And I think what you need are people to really say, what we need here is for funders to recognize preprints. What we need here are for institutions to recognize preprints in um, um, hiring and promotion and tenure. And so because the early adopters will always be seen as the innovators, but, the, but there are always people who are afraid to be part of that early adoption program because they are worried about getting punished. Yeah. And so if you're in a situation where you have the early adopters not only emphasizing the individual roles that scientists can play, but also pushing on institutions to say, actually, you could also help us by saying it's okay if people post preprints in their, you know, narrative CV. Um, so you need multiple strategies, multiple players, multiple peoples with different risk assess different risk levels, and everybody to be listening to those people is what yeah. I guess. And I think just to um, come off that as well, you know, we have policies and we, you know, it's not 
obviously we read all the applications, but actually when it comes to scoring and assessing, that is researchers who are doing that for us. So we need researchers engaged with this agenda um, because it's in those committee meetings where we need people to say, well, hang on a second. I think you have just undermined this because it was a preprint and that is not okay. So it's, you know, as you discussed, Needy, about bringing, you know, constantly raising that equity, you know, the priority, you need, you need everyone in the room to have their ears open for biases um, and to advocate for the policies and practices um, that you're trying to push forward as well. Patrick? And one, I just want to add one thing. I just, I think you need lots of different people doing this advocacy because different arguments will work with different people. And so you cannot always rely on it's the right thing to do because, <laughs> oh my God, I would love if that's true. But you need, if you have multiple people advocating, you have multiple people bringing their viewpoints, their strategies, there's going to be one viewpoint that works for one person and one person and one other viewpoint that's convincing for another person. And you have to recognize that as part of the strategy. I mean, it's not ideal, but it's reality. Patrick. All right. Um, I'm Patrick. I'm a PhD student. I'm working in neuroimmunology in a Max Planck group in Germany. And I've just started my PhD and I work with quite some uh, young researchers in European and international research associations. So I have two questions. My first one being, where do you see especially young students in the role? Because I can still remember when I've heard the first time about bioarchive and I thought like, oh, uh, that sounds interesting. Like I didn't know that it was kind of a preprint uh, platform there. So I would be interested in how do you see, for example, bachelors and masters involved there and what do you think, which role can they play? Do you want to go first, Needy? Sure. Um, I think that they can play a powerful role. I mean, I think that they are, I mean, they are the next generation of faculty. They are the next generation of postdocs. They are, the, right? If they are the, if they are advocating in the same ways that Hannah and I are emphasizing that people in committees can do this, right? If they're going to their fact, so Hannah mentioned that scientists can bring the issue of preprints up with their funders and say, you know, this is a slightly vague um, definition of research output is pre our preprints included and clarify that. Master's students, undergrads, BS students, PhD students are in a similar situation in their lab environments. They can go to their PI. They can go to their the directors of the grad program. They can go to their grad advising committee and say, are preprints accepted as a research output for graduation? Are preprints accept, right? So because of the ways that we use research output at every stage of assessment, at every stage of training, there is a role here for every student at every level, every scientist to say, should we be thinking about preprints as a valuable and viable research output for this assessment process? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And then I guess the other point would be to, you know, use them, you know, use them when you're writing your dissertations, you know, include them in citations or uh, preprint journal clubs, you know, demonstrate that kind of, that they are just part of the system. And I think that supports then any arguments in terms of, um, you know, their role in terms of research assessment as well. And the second question, I first thank you for, for your input. I think it's very interesting, especially uh, the perspective of actually using it as a as an output and then of course to, to use it for your personal quote unquote benefit, right? Um, to, to maybe graduate. Secondly, it's more related uh, to, to the welcome um, trust. So, so to Hannah, it would be interesting to me because when, when you showed this graphic, you also um, like, it was something about mental health and something about climate and sustainability there. Uh, could you just summarize yes. this one or two minutes? Uh, yeah, sure. So we um, we fund in climate and health. It's not climate and sustainability. So it's the inter it's it's how climate change is impacting health. Um, 
on and the health of individuals um, and we're looking at how uh, people can adapt to prevent that health damage how can you mitigate um, from the impacts of health damage and more so um, welcome.org is the place for more information on that okay. in terms of what we fund and the areas that we fund in all right that's great so again, uh, thank you so much. I will also put put my information in in the chat, just like if anybody wants to reach out, because I think all all the things you do to to share this with young researchers across the world and in Europe would be super valuable. So, would be super happy to hear from you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Olivier. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. I think the narrative CVs that you both both of you mentioned. It's probably a great way to go forward, but uh, there are some issues in practice, of course. Um, like um, the, the narration is more likely to uh, favor people who, get, who are more fluent, like with the with the language, um, more convincing, sometimes perhaps at the cost of sincerity, and um, and and there is also the the volume to to assess. It's it's more work to for the for the, the evaluators. To, to to read uh, narratives and extract the information from the narrative, make sure that the narrative is sincere, etc. So uh, there are some issues anyway. Um, but then uh, I had a, a, a quite provo provocative question, uh, but probably unavoidable for you, Nidhi. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, and I'm actually provoked and shocked myself by my question. Um, <laughs> are you not assuming implicitly that uh, staying in academia and 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 going forward in academia is uh, a synonym of success, and that there would be other types of successes by leaving academia for some people, depending on their on on their values, on their on their yeah wills, on on whatever they want to do with their lives, um, and and what the you you wrote that scholars who are um, diverse, uh, are, uh, innovate at higher rates, and how? Uh, what if uh, for people who innovate at, at higher rates, they would meet success more easily outside academia? So do you know if if there is a uh, or in merrier horizons? Uh, do you know if there if there has been any studies uh, that has um, followed people who left academia to to see if if it was their will or if it was against their will if they if they were happy with it if they because in the end i mean and i, I said it was a provocative question that's okay and i i mean i appreciate your your framing it that way and i think that you get at an interesting point right you right i implicitly state that like ascension in academia is that that is some level of success. And one interpretation of that or um, implicit a conclusion of that is, is that going out of academia is not included in that success. And I did not mean that at all. And I appreciate you making that distinction because what I do want to emphasize is, is that once a scientist, always a scientist, right? So people who do not, uh, who do not continue on in academia stay scientists continue to innovate, continue to participate in producing science, they just don't do it in academia. But I would also point out that because academia trains such a substantial portion of our scientists, we set up a paradox then where trainees who, in, who might be innovating at a higher level don't see themselves reflected in the, um, in the higher echelons of academia. And that generates another feedback loop. So I, I would I would argue that even in the context of them innovating at higher levels and deciding that academia may not be the place where they can successfully innovate, they are also seeing that their models are not their, their role models may not be represented in those higher echelons. And I would also say that there has been a large body of research, some of it also by Kenny Gibbs, that demonstrates that student that trainees often come into training positions convinced that they want to stay in academia succeed at similar levels as their well-represented counterparts at their historically excluded groups, but then see that the values that are present in academia do not accurately reflect their values. Mm. Now, values is a very loaded term. It's a very vague term. And so I think you can assign what you want to that sense of values. Is it that 
science moves too slow in the rate of academia and they decide they wanna leave where science can have a much more um, um, accelerated and or um, impactful role on their communities. That's entirely possible. Um, is it that they that there are elements of academia where there's a hyper competitiveness that feeds into um, the sense of who is identified as a successful scientist and who is not identified as a su successful scientist? If you're going to argue to me, if you're going to say to me that people might be leaving because they don't see the values that they see espoused in science, it's also possible that that hyper competitiveness, which contributes to bias which accentuates and entrenches bias, we've seen that in lots of different contexts, is also a value that they're, um, that they're responding to, right? And so I, there is data, there is definitely data that shows that students, when they come in as trainees, they are responding to the environment of academia. And that environment in academia is incredibly homogenous. And, you know, based on what I know about other institutions, that plays into that decision making. Thank you very much. I agree. I agree. We we also have this um, in the French. Uh, well, in, in France, when we when we speak about science, etc., and and the interaction with society, it's even in the law the, that the the PhD uh, is training by and for research. And I for a long time I I was um, in line with that. I agreed with that. But now I don't anymore. It's training by research for sure, but not only for research. It's for a lot of things. And we cannot at the same time complain that that there are like um, politicians and, and uh, administrative people who without a, a, a scientific uh, training and at the same time only uh, put forward uh, this uh, scientific achievement as the only goal of any scientific trainee uh, from, from the start. Anyway, but but I agree very much with what you are saying. I mean, in the end, that's that's what's important. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. There are a couple of questions in the chat, but we've got an experimental let's hope it works portion of the call today. Um, I'm going to use you all as my guinea pigs, unfortunately. So I'm going to start a whiteboard and you should all be able to add on to this whiteboard. Hopefully it loads for you all soon. Now, what you're seeing here is a rather simple question. So what are the current challenges or issues with preprint recognition in research assessment? Now, you can drag the post-it notes on the left here, and you can type onto the post-it notes what you think. We've got an arrow going across the screen, most important and urgent to address at the top right, and those that are not as important but should still be addressed eventually down on the left. All I want you to do is write out what you think a current challenge or issue is with recognition in terms of research assessment, drag it onto the map and type away. And the colours don't matter, I just thought people would like colour choice. And we just leave, leave the sticky notes wherever we want, right? Yeah. Place them where you think in terms of your challenge is most important to address immediately or... Oh, okay, 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 okay. I like the background music that someone's got of an ice cream van. Is that you, Johnny? It is me. It clearly is not horrible enough weather to stop them, is it? No. Royalty free music, though, so we're all right. Okay, I'm going to give this one a couple more minutes and then we're going to jump onto a second board we've got prepared as well. Like I said, we'll. Clean these up a little bit and I will share these with everyone at the end.
print quality or peer review seems to be coming up a little bit here as well. I had meant to put that on my kind of thoughts for the future and whether the kind of like research integrity conversations that are happening actually may potentially shut a door on preprints that would be quite negative, I think. Um, that was just one point from a slide that I forgot. I think it's a very interesting discussion that still needs to be had, actually. Because I, I, I'm, one of the things I've noticed is there is a lot of people are accepting peer reviewed preprints quite off, a lot now and adding that barrier almost to it rather than just a preprint on its own. Okay, so I'm going to interrupt everyone and share a second screen. Uh, what do the colors mean? The colors do not mean anything. Okay, just to be beautiful in the end. Have I shared that second screen? I don't know if that's worked. No, there is only one screen, it's, it's yeah. still the same one. <laughs> okay. Do you all have on the bottom right of your screen a page button that lets you go to page two? No, but we can. Yeah. Move. We can paint the. Yeah. Okay. It I've looks seen. like two little boxes or two rectangles on top of each other on the bottom right. Oh, yes. Fab. If you could all go on to the second screen, please. So this time we're actually asking what actions that researchers, funders, or universities can take to drive preprint recognition in research assessment. This time we've got a split on a graph here. So your left axis is the impact. So at the top it's high impact, at the bottom it's low impact. And then on the right, you've got effort. So you've got low effort to high effort. So anything in the top right quadrant would be big picture type projects. So these are things that are high impact, but high effort. Contrast that to the bottom left, which are incremental improvements. So these are low effort, but they're also low impact. And again, the colors here are just, just to pretty it up a little bit. Quality seems to be coming up as a common topic for big projects. That is a big question. It's a very hard question to address. I'm going to give it one more minute and then do a quick wrap up. But I'm glad this seems to have worked. That was good. Transparency around tenure and job ads is a, I think that's a big one that is so easy to do. And funding policies. Um, I think if we still at Welcome could do more on that um, and many other funders could do. I, you know, I wanted to put this in the big projects, but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I would, you know, I, I bring this point up quite a bit and I, and I don't, I really think that there is such precarity 
and insecurity and hyper competitiveness in science right now, that that is a huge project. I think on some fundamental level, because all of us feel so precarious in our own relative spaces, that contributes to a level of insecurity in assessment of research. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I think having a conversation about hyper competitiveness and insecurity and precarity in, in uh, research right now would be, you know, a big feels thing maybe, but um, it's, it's, it is a foundational contribution to so much of what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. We've, you know, at, at Welcome, we've recently made some changes to grants, you know, they're, they're longer, they're bigger, in part to try and like, counteract some of that, but we are only part of that environment. And there is that ish, the precarity within the institutions themselves that we can't, we can't counteract that as grant funders. Um, you know, I think it's why in the, there was a question in the chat about who has the most levers, funders or institutions. And, you know, actually we have to work together in making these changes because we are, we are dependent on each other. Okay. I'm, I'm about to close the whiteboard because we are out of time. I will clean that up and share it with everyone afterwards thank you so um i only had one more thing to say which is nice and quick so asap bio are currently running a survey for trying to gather people's perceptions and use of preprints as part of the graduation requirements um jessica and i are also trying to collate a list of current graduation requirements and find examples where preprints are explicitly stated as acceptable um having mixed success with that. I think a lot of it is hidden in handbooks. So if you could all dig out your old university PhD handbook um, and have a flick through, that would be great. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining and I will share the chat questions afterwards so you can all see the questions that were answered in the chat as well. If you have any questions at all, get in touch with Jessica or I. I'm always happy to chat. Thank you, everyone. And thank you everyone for participating. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.